This week I'm joined by Dr. Valentin Gellier, who is a scholar and musician who teaches metaphysics, philosophy of religion and Shakespeare studies at the University of Cambridge. In this episode we discuss his book Shakespeare and the Grace of Words, Language, Theology and Metaphysics. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paying patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. If you'd like to support the podcast or gain access to some exclusive content, then please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, Valentin Gellier, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Absolute pleasure. I'm enjoying the podcast. Thank you very much. Uh, we are going to be discussing your book, Shakespeare and the Grace of Words, Language, Theology, Metaphysics, which is published by Routledge um, last year, 2022. Uh, and this is a, dis- uh, a book on, as people would imagine, uh, about Shakespeare, about language. Um, and that's sort of the first part of the book is roughly split into two parts. The first part of the book is this exposition somewhat of your own thought and somewhat of the history of people who have read Shakespeare via a theological and um, emphatically doxological lens uh, and then the second part goes into a reading focused on King Lear and the Winter's Tale as the two primary texts that you you use to bring in all these um, different threads um, but I guess before we jump in with the book just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, why did you write this? <laughs> okay um A little bit about myself. Well, currently, I can tell you what I'm doing currently. Um, I'm here at uh, Dartington Art School in Devon, um, senior lecturer in Poetics of Imagination, and um, also um, head of programs. So it's a very kind of exciting new venture for me that I've only just started. Um, And um, before jumping into higher education um, wholeheartedly, I was... I was doing some teaching, but I was also a a performer and a musician. did quite a lot of um, Shakespeare teaching, both in uh, academic and non-academic settings and directing as well. Um, And I I guess during working with students, um, performing, reading, thinking about Shakespeare, I just sort of increasingly became aware that there were certain moments um, in which, and this could happen in a room while reading or or in rehearsal, or even sometimes, believe it or not, in performance, there were moments in which, um, for want of better words, a kind of special quality, there was a kind of special sense um, arose as a result of performing and saying Shakespeare together in such a way that it felt a little bit like... um, like the words were kind of charged with an energy or vitality of truth about them. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I think we're educated to ignore uh, these sorts of experiences as being just kind of subjective. But uh, I decided to go with it um, and and see if I could actually um, deepen and and give a a kind of conceptual, even metaphysical uh, framework for these experiences and what was happening in them. So it was really genuinely as a result of engaging with Shakespeare that I decided as I kind of um, became less of an artist and more of a teacher uh, and more of a uh, sort of academically centered person, whatever that means, mm. uh, I just decided to sort of um, focus on that. And, uh, and, and really as well, James, I've loved Shakespeare since I was... 14 and and i've had an interest in kind of mystical philosophy and theology and things like that also since i was that age so it's a kind of convergence of two lifelong interests as well Mm -hmm. Uh, it's strange isn't it behind all the academic conferences talk papers peer-reviewed things of these kinds very rarely do you hear an academic say admit Oh, I still enjoy this, by the way. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, this is what I've tried. I guess what I've tried to do with the podcast is talk to academics and go. You do realize that you, you got into this because you actually, in, you know, you enjoy yeah. it. And I think academia, unfortunately, is structured in such a way that there's only it's fleeting times where you get down just to talk about the thing that you enjoy. Unfortunately, instead of taking it to court and attacking it or defending it or whatever it might be. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you spent so much time creating a kind of system of defense and kind of positioning yourself within debate and all that sort of stuff that you actually very easily lose the sense um, 
the sense that just sort of brought you to 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 studying uh, in the first place and this is why i love teaching i think teaching keeps you honest with that um if you get too lost in research then you're you're lost in the perpetual war whereas in teaching you have to transmit something you have mm-hmm. to transmit something that is alive for you i think um so i only have a, a, a slightly reluctant place mm-hmm. in academia but i have a very joyful place in teaching that's mm-hmm. really where i feel at home so what exactly is the poetics of imagination? This is the, <laughs> the, the course you teach. Yeah, I mean, it's a really beautiful the kind of daring MA, um, which was uh, created by Martin Shaw, the mythologist. Mm-hmm. I know, and I know. really, um, the, the drive behind that MA is to um, affirm and argue that um, when humans think, they think in story. Mm-hmm. Um, they think in narrative. So, so story as the sort of basic unit of human meaning Mm -hmm. and the ma is an incredible investigation into Mm -hmm. all that um i mean martin's specialisms are things like you know arthurian romance and celtic um uh, he even knows you know shamanic traditions all that sort of stuff i bring in the shakespeare and the dante and the william blake Uh, we've also got alice oswald who's a wonderful poet uh, who's also um, with a um, enduring fascination for Homer, so it's a very very rich program, um, and uh, and also it's got a beautiful creative component as well. It's very much a program for budding artists and writers and poets, um, and yeah, uh, it's one of those um, one of those things. I really feel at home um, teaching on this. I really feel like ah, that's what I was meant to be doing. <laughs> So the book kind of serves that a bit, yeah. It sounds like a good course. It sounds a very intuitive, expansive course. Mm. I'm glad they still exist. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, before we go any further, um, I have to ask you the Hermetics question. Uh, you can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen on them, listen in on the conversation. Uh, and the bard, William Shakespeare, is already there. Um, and I think, actually, this is, I mean... It's quite tough for me to remember this, but I don't recall Shakespeare ever being put in this room. <laughs> so, yeah. You know what? I don't want him to be in this room. All right, we'll get rid of him. Yeah. <laughs> um, I like the kind of elusive, enigmatic presence of Shakespeare. I don't actually need to hear his, um, his voice. That's a really hard one, James. I'm sure I'm not the first one to say that. <laughs> and and I, probably my answer would be... Um, a different on a day-to-day basis but today hmm. um if it were just to listen in on the conversation um i would love to hear um ivan ilich i would love to hear ivan ilich um and meister eckhart might be another um and then perhaps someone like hildegard of bingen mm-hmm. <laughs> interesting mix see now that's a good use of the room because this is you know after thinking about this now for many years i've realized i wouldn't want so so shakespeare is one of the last people i'd want in the room because (laughs) well nothing about his work is to do with him talking right so illich eckhart you're actually going to they they are built for that room i don't know as much about bingham but shakespeare you'd almost say he'd probably say look i've i've put it on the paper, go read my plays, you know. Uh, I think it's, I'm not as huge of a fan of it anymore, but Christopher Hitchens says, you know, if anything, meeting these people, you know, would be a disappointment because the, as you know, as someone who's written a book, I mean, a lot of what writing is, is just sitting down in silence and grinding out word after word, as Orwell yeah. says. So it's, yeah. you know, you're not going to suddenly speak to Shakespeare and he just goes into some miraculous monologue or speech so it will probably would be disappointing but Illich, Illich, Bingen and Eckhart would be a very are you a religious man yourself not in any uncomplicated way <laughs> um so it's uh, it's uh, both a yes and a no I think mm-hmm. um, um I'm very I'm very open to all things religious and spiritual I find very difficult to I find um, an implicit part of the religious attitude for me is the resistance to labels and limitations. So that's why I can't answer that question in a straightforward way. Maybe uh, I could use that question in a way to pry open your book, which is why why then would you write a book about theology and Shakespeare? That's a great question. <laughs> 
Um, and yeah, my students often ask me the same. Um, I think, um, I mean, as I said before, undeniably, there was a, a kind of interest in, uh, you know, as I said, mystical philosophy, religious experience, all that sort of stuff, without necessarily uh, a feeling that I had to uh, swear allegiance to any particular version of that, uh, of those phenomena. Um, so it was a kind of long-standing thing. But at the same time, I knew I wanted to write about Shakespeare. I knew I needed to be true to the experiences that I had had. Mm-hmm. And I felt that a literary, a literature department and even a philosophy department might not actually let me do that mm-hmm. because they're lost in, or lost, not maybe not lost, but certainly caught in their own battles and their own things. Um, and only the divinity people would be mad enough <laughs> to, to, to be kind of open um, to some of the, the more daring claims, perhaps, of the, of the research. So, so as someone who is friendly to um, theology and friendly to uh, religion, without necessarily being completely engaged, um, I just felt that it, it was kind of natural in that way. And funnily enough, um, I, I did find a kind of surprising continuity between a sort of, um, let's say, very broadly speaking, a sort of Platonic Christian approach mm-hmm. and Shakespeare. I just thought that that seems to work. That seems to ring true. Um, so that intuitive feeling that you mentioned, you know, you've, you've, you're approaching this work really because of um, experience, uh, experience, you know, experiential things, which is something that w- everyone perhaps is touching on and acknowledging as you're performing and reading Shakespeare as it's, you know, as it's sort of meant to be um, expounded as a play, as read out aloud. This, this feeling... If you had to put your finger on it, I mean, that's probably the big question, I guess, for you. I mean, what? How would you describe that? And that's that. That seems to be the the kernel that your book is then revolving around. Is how can we describe this? Um, you know, what <laughs> this yeah. lo- lower lower R sort of revelation. You know, I don't yeah. want, I don't want to conflate Shakespeare with scripture or gospel, but the no. same the same thing is happening with the gospels, right? That this intuitive capital W word is becoming word you know something as you said a truth an intuitive sense feeling has to then come through something sort of lesser than it so what's going on here yeah um right and you're right that's the crux of the book isn't it i mean the 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 the, the crux of the book really is to say that when language is doing what it's meant to be doing um, it is, and um, you know, here's already something we can talk about, but it is not lost in a perpetual sea of equivocal difference. Mm. It is actually, um, um, it is actually energized by a kind of primordial sense of affirmation of saying yes to, to goodness or to the good. Mm-hmm. And that, that that sense of primordial affirmation of saying yes to the goodness of things, to the goodness of being, precedes our utterance and directs it. And so when we speak truly, this is what the book tries to argue, when we speak truly, we praise. Mm. In our speech, there is this yes, there's this kind of yesing, <laughs> you know, there's this kind of um, um, affirmation of of being, which is also at the same time a saying what we are affirming so it's not just saying hooray mm-hmm. kind of opening up the, sp- the sphere of being to to articulate what it is um and and um so so praise is a kind of affirmation and articulation by by which i mean language is continuously surprising because it's continuously revealing more aspects of the real in this mode of 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 laudation of affirmation of saying yes to so so uh in a sense i'm saying that language in its ground in its in its in its origin as word with a capital w is first of all praise Mm -hmm. and then and then when that kind of seeps through our own human language um something of that quality glimmers in our words 
What do you think gets in the way to change that truth to falsity, which obviously happens far more often than not, you know, it's not, not like everyone's going around, uh, speaking the truth. No. Everyone is, um, tweaking things. Yes, absolutely. Well, I mean, I mean, that's, um, that's the kind of tragic, um, situation that occupies m many of Shakespeare's plays. I would argue when language becomes, uh, when language is assumed to be in our possession mm. and not a gift from a kind of original source, um, then it is transformed into <clears throat> a tool to manipulate and control, um, to freeze the world into a kind of map, uh, which we can um, uh, reduce into into bits that we can then uh, use for our own benefit. Um, so transforming words into tools for power and control really um, is this is this kind of wrenching of language away from its own ground, and that. In Shakespeare, for example, in, in King Lear and much of the Winter's Tale, I argue is the is the problematic condition. So when we make when we make language a weapon um, mm. to uh, to um, perform what our unrestrained will desires, in a sense. Do you see Shakespeare then as in his writing one of the the beauty of his writing is that as he is, you know, just expounding a narrative, which is, you know, as you said, from uh, the Poetics of Imagination course is sort of that unconscious foundational level of how humans come to understand things within this narrative and within the way it's written. You know, as you say, it's not just the tragedy for itself, the falsity of language for itself, but the, the way that it is sculpted reveals, you know, the 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 possible pitfalls of the language itself as it's going along. So it's not some sort of, um, if you've read someone like Michel Welbeck, who it's almost like tragedy is um, begetting itself and loving itself for its own misery. Um, <laughs> Shakespeare, Shakespeare is is making both, like almost, almost like all three sides apparent mm. within the same narrative, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, um, I'm not suggesting that Shakespeare was some kind of, Meister Eckhart like mystic, you know, sort of intuiting the eternal and kind of sermonizing. But I do think he had his a sense of at the heart of drama, there is an expression of that yes. Mm. What is it? In other words, characters are always in Shakespeare, kind of always saying yes to something. Mm -hmm. They're making a, a sort of soul choice, if you will. Mm -hmm. They're saying yes to that and Therefore, no to all this, mm -hmm. and this yesing is the is is expressed in their action and in their speech. Um, so drama is always this kind of choice, um, in the light of reality, um, not being inert and unintelligent, but reality always asking you, "What are you going to do? You're being put here. What are you going to do?" Mm -hmm. And I think I think Shakespeare has this kind of instinctive sense, and therefore the poetics of praise that I, that I, I ex try to explain in the book um, is kind of something he's doing without without thinking. Um, it's just that's how he that's how he views drama. That's how he views drama to work. So in this development of you know this 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 affirmation, this saying yes, and therein of course there is the inherent no because you're denying everything else. And as you yeah. previously mentioned, from this yes, you're sort of beginning to ve develop a linguistic map or a map of the world which you consider reality. And I guess in a certain sense, you might move away from truth. In this sense, you might move more towards tragedy. You know, unknowingly, sort of like an Oedipus Oedipus play or something like that. But um, this is for you where it seems the importance and you write about this a lot sort of as the foundation uh, one of the foundations of your book is why it's so important that we are linguistic beings you know that mm -hmm. shakespeare is focusing on this fact of this development of a as you just said like a map a reality but your being is entwined with this i guess from your own course once again the myth making the language that's being used yeah yeah yes i mean it is an audacious uh, <laughs> Thesis. I mean, just to just to kind of um, imagine the universe as kind of always already linguistic in a sense. I mean, that's not my create my creation. You can you can look back at you know um, you know sort of phenomenology in a Heideggerian strand, and and others ha have looked at that uh, in in a sort of uh, contemporary context. But 
But I think it's also an insight that the Middle Ages and the, and the Renaissance had, you know, that there's a sort of, that you you come in, as a human being, you come in in the middle of things. Things are busy expressing themselves. Um, um, and and you come in in the middle of that expression, in, mm. in the middle of that song. And there's an implicit challenge. You know, what are you, go- what are you going to contribute to the great music of love? Are you <laughs> going to sing with it? Or are you going to fight against it and, and attempt to put in your own... Um, attempt to control it to kind of manage your own ends as it were so i do see um i do try to suggest that that reality is always already linguistic in ways that completely escape us um and i do try to suggest that that goes all the way down that the material world is itself somehow involved in this expression uh, linguistic expression. So I don't just mean words, by the way, when I say linguistic, I mean expression in a much broader sense, gestures, silences, you know, um, the, the sort of eloquence of of being alive, really. So it's a kind of very broad picture. So in a sense, we have no choice. Hmm. We're, we're, we're involved in this linguistic universe and, the, and our expression is extraordinarily important. Um, it's just, are we going to express, are we going to express something that, that, that resonates with, with love, or are we going to express something that resonates with nothing (laughs) or with ego Mm -hmm. or with power? Do you, do you think tragedy then in that sense is the denial of already being in the middle of something? Tragedy is sort of saying, no, 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 I'm, I'm beginning this and I'll end this. Yep. And I'll end this because if I say I'm beginning this, I'm going to end this because in Shakespeare, it, the, the, the great tragedies like Lear do end up looking like it's just going to end. Like that's what, that's what Lear um, in the middle of the, of the play, you know, when he's been banished by his own daughters, I mean, it's absolutely awful the way they treat him. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, he's, he's being sent out into the storm. Incidentally, there's a storm out here just now. So it's kind of a picturesque. Um, you know, he he demands the annihilation of, of the world. And and there's a sense in which if I say I make the world, I control the world, I say the world, you know, mm-hmm. um, the outcome is, uh, you know, utter despair, really. Um, so that, I think, in the way that I read Shakespeare, that often ends up being the tragic pull of things. Hmm. And, do you th- and this... Early on, you talk about these different readings of Shakespeare. That, that, that historically, the the the, um, the readings and analysis of Shakespeare, which is related to your book, and one thing you you emphasize is, I guess, against your reading of this affirmation of this saying yes, is, I guess, would you see it as a misconstrual? of you know this annihilation as a nihilistic reading of Shakespeare that there is this undercurrent of, uh, I guess, you know, well, yeah, nihilism. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, yes, I do. I mean, I think, I think um, literary studies have had to contend with the hermeneutics of suspicion for a long time, mm-hmm. um, and um, and and it did some good things. You know, I mean, I suppose before all that came into view in the you know in the sixties onwards, perhaps there were some interesting let's just call them religious readings of shakespeare they were very they they could become very rigid Mm -hmm. um here's the allegory you know shakespeare or here are the christian symbols or every narrative is about fallen redemption or cordelia is a christ-like figure you know and then it becomes this kind of very mapped out kind of frozen way of reading and and had lost some of the dynamics i think when the postmodern uh readings or the or the hermeneutics of suspicion centered readings uh, happened it, it it sort of did away with some of these more rigid ones mm-hmm. and also reintroduced the notion which i'm saying in the book is part of the medieval and renaissance way of conceiving language of this kind of always alreadiness of mm-hmm. always already being involved but at the same time i think the problem is that the, the the suspicion thing makes you ultimately read language as power you know that language is ultimately a game of uh, force and counterforce. You know it's war, really, and it's and it's about power dynamics. And so, what Shakespeare is doing poetically, instead of doing what I'm saying he's doing, which is kind of articulating the goodness of things, 
from that other point of view, the sort of literary studies point of view, he can't be doing that. He's ultimately just like poetic language is just a flourish on the nakedly political reality of things, mm. which is just power dynamics. And so I think increasingly it became caught in that. And so you can't really do anything with religion mm -hmm. in any interesting way if that's the way you see language, because it's just going to be an expression of that that basic power game mm. um, and and therefore can't, can't reveal anything of itself. And as well, I think, you know, a, a fundamental thing that happens in Shakespeare is reconciliation. Mm -hmm. uh, um, genuine relation, which is something that can happen with and through our expression, mm -hmm. through our language. But with the with the sort of the hermeneutics of suspicion-centered readings, you can't have that. The, the, the other is always inarticulate. And if you articulate something with them or for them, it's seen as, no, that's oppressive. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're taking over. Um, so, so a central quality of so many Shakespearean drama, which is forgiveness, reconciliation, community, uh, is not possible on those readings. So even even forgiveness becomes suspect in those yeah. readings. And forgiveness for you is so fundamental. It's this sort of foundation of society, as you write about it in the mm. in, in your book. Um, so is that a, is that a case of sort of a you know? the context of the 60s, 70s and 80s readings is perhaps they're just drawing in too much of their own uh, personal experience and sort of almost missing missing Shakespeare. Because once you once you sort of, un, you know, you mentioned religion there is becoming quite rigid. Once you, um, especially within a secular culture, once you sort of understand religion and therefore its values as these sort of just socio-cultural relics, you know, goodness, truth, beauty, oh, these are all these things which we now know are all silly. Well, <laughs> then they they clearly aren't going to have space to breathe in Shakespeare, who is writing about them in an earnest way. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, that's, it's, a, it's a, such a big question. I mean, I think I think this this assumption that we can – I think that this assumption that we can critique these things like truth, goodness, and beauty as though we were outside of them, you know, this kind of safe space of academic, um, objective kind of critique or, or clever critique, because I've read the latest French philosopher, you know, <laughs> um, I think is, is ignoring that we ourselves are in the sway of, of language and the sway of narratives. And so we are, um, uh, we are implicated in um in these these symbols like truth and goodness and beauty we're not just kind of scientists in a, in a kind of cultural science lab you know uh, analyzing there's something that precedes us that is that is underway so there's something a little bit dishonest about doing that um about about choosing that stance but at the same time i do want to say you know, I'm not saying all religion is good. I'm not saying like, oh, you know, let the let the church do what it wants. And uh, you know, I I do say I do think there are some good things that come out of the critical uh, bent of mind. But I think past the critique, we need to come back to something that 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 you, that uh, synthesizes or unites or brings people together. So that's why I try to say hopefully in in harmony with shakespeare that the essence of society is not um power negotiations and power games mm. um but but in a sense forgiveness understood as the perpetual and ever renewed ever surprising gift of space um and love to one another so gift is kind of like the basic unit of society in a sense mm -hmm. Um, and so the, the, the reigning categories of that are generosity and hospitality, uh, listening, openness, um, rather than suspicion, analysis, um, um, power, critique, all those things. Well, I guess once you hold that pretense that you're somehow outside of language or outside of something, um, then all the things which language allows, such as love, forgiveness, can't really be in their actual sense. So you end up in this sort of sort of strange Tower of Babel, uh, but I'm above this right. thing. Yeah. You, you never are above this, so at all. But then, of course, the, the characters in, as you say, the characters in Shakespeare's plays are also uh, believe they're in this position. They do, yeah. And I think that's, that's, the, that's, that's the tragic thing. I mean, in a sense, um, 
It's, I think the thing about forgiveness is that it's something you can't do yourself. It's something that has to come to you a bit. So this is why I'm interested in gift and grace, because I see it as a, a kind of, let's just put, let's just say a collaborative effort between ourselves and something other than ourselves. I think, I, I mean, I think that's just, uh, it's not just me dreaming. I think it's a fact. If you just say to someone, I forgive you because I decided to, it's just an ethical a diktat that you impose on yourself. Mm. And I think genuine moments of forgiveness are also moments where you recognize, you truly listen to, mm. and are generous, generously hospitable to the other in such a way that who they are and what they're saying surprises you. And so the gift of forgiveness is something that comes with and from that surprise a bit. Um, so th there needs to be receptivity and openness. Now, in contrast, the tragic character's in Shakespeare, certainly in Lear, have really lost that. Um, I think they've they've become entrenched into an attitude of um, all all relationship is really negotiations, mm -hmm. diplomacy at best, um, force and counterforce at worst, and there isn't that receptivity or that openness to kind of listening. This is why Cordelia can't speak, I think, in the first scene of Lear, um, because, I mean, I think it's a very um, not a very politically wise thing to do, to say, I will say nothing. Um, so perhaps she, she's, she could have done otherwise there, I don't know. But certainly the point is that she perceives that the situation at the beginning of Lear where King Lear is knowingly creating a situation in which, you know, he's performing a kind of rhetorical page and to kind of get get what he wants out of it. That's a situation in which true words can't be heard. Mm. That's a situation where words and love are on different destinies. Um, and so if, if so things can't be heard, if there's not receptivity, if there's not listening, that coincides with characters saying, well, language is just about me talking. <laughs> it's not about this gr this greater listening to what might come through me from and with the other. It's just about me imposing my uh, my project on things. Mm. And this, you know, you say on page 115, language overburdened by force creates a demonic surplus. Is this this sort of surplus that you're talking about, right? Yeah, so that's really interesting. So, I mean, that that's something, again, I, I became aware in studying Shakespeare and King Lear is that he really portrays the kind of downfall of language of all the traditional modes of language um, that that were, you know, uh, in, in use in his time and perhaps in, in many times in the courtly mode, the rhetorical mode, uh, even the sort of wit mode of the fool, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're all kind of accepted conventions of speech. And in Lear, they break down one by one. You know, a lot of people see the fool as this extraordinarily wise character. And, and he is in some respects, but ultimately he's a courtly fool. So mm -hmm. he is bound by his role in the court to kind of be this kind of counter wit you know, showing a mirror to the king saying, hey, you, you know, what are you doing here? And and in Lear, all those accepted social conventional modes break down one by one until you're left with a sort of, um, until you're left with a sort of situation in which just language can't speak itself, to, that love is just banished from the stage. And so there's this weird situation in which there's this character, um, Edgar, who becomes Tom of Bedlam. It's a kind of theatrical um, counter move uh, where he speaks a sort of paradoxical, weirdly kind of shamanic, half inspired, half despairing language that doesn't fit in any of these categories. Mm -hmm. And so that's the demonic surplus I was trying to say that, that there's a sort of, there's nothing left but to shriek and howl like a demon. There's nothing left but to um, speak a kind of parasocial language, you know? Mm. Language would do anything to to speak more than pain could ever say or force could ever say or power could ever say it's got that surplus it's got that excessive quality it will it will it, no matter how bad it gets love will try to speak on and i think in in the center of leah that's really what's what's going on mm -hmm. do you think in that in that in that sense that you know of language having that excess that it's always trying to bring about more language like language needs its own limitation you know beckett famously says 
uh, what is it? Every sentence is a stain on silence. It's almost like <laughs> you need to. Uh, it, the the further you the further you go with language, the further you risk entering you know back into your own little map of the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that if if language if you understand language to be my possession, <laughs> um, then that that's what will happen. I think you know like there there is, and justly, there is a sort of Beckettian veneration of, let's just say a kind of apophatic attitude to language, feeling like whatever is sacred and good and true, words can never reach. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, there's a side of me, I mean, I do agree with that because, you know, when I talk about love and truth and all such lofty things, they are beyond words, undoubtedly. But I think there's a way to readjust that apophatic need rather than to say, well, the purest form is uh, end language and be in this kind of perpetual... Mm -hmm of saintly silence, um, I'm saying that that the apophasis is in fact this positive demand because there's always more, there's mm -hmm. always new, that, that the true words must be something new and fresh and in the moment and not an outworn truism. And so, so, so in a sense, this kind of negative philosophy and theology that are, that are saying it's the end of words, it's the end of words because words are limited and that limit is in fact asking us to be in the present. Speak anew, speak truly mm -hmm. means speak now so that the unfinished business of language in a way kind of carries on revealing, carries on creating and recreating and re-saying. In the senses of, of that newness and in the sense that um, one can't own language, you can't, you can't possess it. Who is it, who's, yeah. who is it who's speaking here, who's bringing about the truth and the newness? Because it can't be yeah. some sort of human possessor. Yes, exactly. And I think Shakespeare's so so brilliant in understanding that paradoxical thing that that it is you, but it isn't you. Mm -hmm. That you you are you are participating in a in a in a song that is that is bigger than than yourself. But at the same time, that participation in that song makes you yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're you're kind of unique, but decentered at the same time. And Shakespeare's really par paradox. I think is central to his. His his uh, poetics, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think tr do you think true speech, in a sense, is a response to an acknowledgement of that greater truth? It's almost quite recursive. Yeah, yeah, yeah I do think that. I do think I do think that um, it's response to a, a genuine acknowledgement and not repetition of a um, an approved doctrine. So. And that's what makes the word so elusive and mysterious because one person can say something and and you're, you're listening to them and you're thinking, well, you know, what time is it? When am I going to get some food? Mm -hmm. And another person can actually use the same, the same words and it just strikes you, mm -hmm. you know, and it doesn't just strike you, it strikes others as well. And there's, there's, there's a sense that something true has been said. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I do think that that kind of genuine language relies on, seeing and feeling and sensing the 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 kind of fathomless depth and beauty in what you're saying and you're kind of seeing it in the moment that you're saying it and that brings language it's it's authenticity mm. rather than just you know um repeating formulae that you like from you know me quoting meister eckhart or ivan illich or something mm -hmm. you know mm. so to, to bring this back i guess to the beginning where you, you your course about Everything is uh, well. Well, we we understand things in stories. This notion of sort of, I guess, capital T, T truth, and then our own little maps of the world. As we move further, we move away from truth. We enter into our own little stories, which we've completed, and this is how they're going to play out. And yeah. so, I guess what 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 exactly are these larger stories? Do you see them? Uh, you know almost as these archetypal narratives that, that Jung would talk about or, you know, the, 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 the knight's journey, for instance, are these things we can never really escape? Is this, is there a, you know, within Shakespeare's language is the, one of the limitations, the fact that if you just allow this truth to speak through you, what we're talking about, then there is this limitation of almost a select few stories for human, <laughs> human beings. I mean, time and time again, right? Tragedy, tragedy and tragedy. Yeah. 
I mean, I do think that an archetypal approach to story is useful as a study tool mm-hmm. um, um, to kind of detect, detect. I mean, if only in your own life to say, hang on a second, I've been here before. <laughs> I've done this before. <laughs> like, you know, you're kind of, um, you can kind of be be awake to that. Um, I wouldn't want to um, submit to the scientist's um, joy at having revealed the theoretical framework underpinning all human expression. <laughs> because A, that is being part of a story in itself. Mm. The story of the scientist, with this, you know, this, the kind of... Um, almost like that Dr. Faustus <laughs> situation in which um, you're given the, the secret of reality uh, in exchange for something, of course, by the way. Um, so I would say that archetypal, uh, a kind of archetypal uh, thinking can help us on our search, but I, but I do think that they can make things frozen. Mm-hmm. They can make things, uh, all you've got is the structure and the form and you kind of mindlessly apply that to a lot of things. So you're not actually listening mm-hmm. to the newness that those stories bring about. So it's a kind of paradoxical um, framework in a sense that maybe like it, how I understand the platonic tradition that, you know, something like platonic forms are only really seen in particular manifestations, mm-hmm. you know, that that you only see goodness in an instance of goodness, not as some kind of disembodied uh, framework out there, but in the moment, you come to to see it and know it, and that's that moment. It's kind of it's kind of new, and kind of there uh, in reality. So, in other words, if stories aren't doing that, if stories aren't surprising you, renewing you, um, challenging your vision, transforming your 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 senses, you're not listening, <laughs> or they're not really good stories. Mm. And who is it, or what is it we should be listening to? If we were honest with ourselves, I guess you know. If you if you open yourself and allow, what is that thing for you? Mm. Is it God? Does it need to be named? Does it need to be named? <laughs> I don't know. It will speak its name in the story. It will speak its name in the in the poem. Um, I do think that um, I can tell you what we shouldn't be listening to. <laughs> well, in the sense, I mean, I think this present this present age has completely lost its sense of being part of larger stories and narratives. It's just, there's this feeling of like, well, there's this brute reality out there and all these problems and we need to find solutions and we need to manage the outcomes. Mm. So we've, we've become kind of involved into this nightmarish story, technological Mm. story of problem solution and management of resource and even those of us who are looking for for cures and good things kind of unthinkingly walk into that story as though it were the truth mm. um so and i think that's that's part of the story of modernity i think modernity is um inflected with a narrative of progress of overcoming um and and it's that's deep in our culture that's that's one of the big narratives that we are in and um, and I do think we need to listen in different ways to be able to re- to respond to. So in that sense, our, I mean, our course is great because it, it it draws into such ancient stories, you know, whether it's a, you know, a tale from a, a kind of Inuit culture that, that Martin knows about, or whether it's looking at Dante's Divine Comedy, you're going to very alien cosmoses. Mm-hmm. You know, you take a kind of, and, and that makes your own time strange. Mm-hmm. It kind of gives you a, a different standpoint so you can begin to say, oh, actually, I'm not where I think I am. Mm-hmm. So drawing on these ancient stories really can help sort of refresh um, our vision and our, and, our, and our sense, our narrative sense, refine, refine that. Mm. So might it, be, might, might it be the case that we, 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 you know, you mentioned the myth of progress there. We we are still within these greater lif- uh, greater myths, but ours are just, kind of boring you know we, we don't we don't have we don't have you know clashes of titans or gods or you know our god everything is um most myths it seems most of those sort of historical myths and stories there is this great lack of control uh, a lack of control i should say you know there's something that this is the great nemesis this is the the titan that's going to come over the hill and destroy things and ours are all about here's why it's all going to play out in our favor yeah and normally yeah. that can't work as a story you know if you said i've got an idea for a story what is it well there's a hero and everything works out fine there's never any struggle 
Oh, okay. Why write yeah. it? Why write it? You couldn't write it. No. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And and I mean, I'm with William Blake on this one. I think I I think that in in you you described it really well. Like, here's how it's going to play out. Like, I'm in charge here. That in itself is created is is created upon a kind of theology. There's a sort of you know, as you see yourself, so you see God kind of thing going on. And, you know, Blake has this this amazing character called Urizen, um, who is um, um, the, the, the sort of um, the controlling, measuring, rationalizing God, you know, who, who, who reduces reality to a kind of inert passive resource mm. um and and i think that that that's the god of modernity in a sense so there's a there's a spectral theology going on there's a phantomatic kind of theology at play um where we've we've reimagined ourselves as that kind of all powerful uh god acting upon a passive submissive world um so ultimately we need to reawaken we need to be honest that there's a there's a theology here it's mm-hmm. not just it's not just change the change the problem solution framework a little bit let's do a little bit of that let's recycle a bit more or you know i mean those things are important as far as they go but we do need to be more uh, ambitious and and really involve ourselves more into uh the fields of imagination and narrative to kind of get a, a wider perspective and a deeper perspective as to where it is we are. Why does if it have you read to be, Dante, sorry? So why does it have to be theology and, uh, and not, you know, not science or uh, some other form of study? Why theology? Because I think, it, I mean, it, I'm not saying it has to be Christian theology or theology in any recognizable mm-hmm. form. Maybe in, it yet ha- has to be created. Um, and, and it could certainly involve and include science. Um, but I do think, you know, again, b- coming back to, to what the book is about is what we choose to make reflects what we hold to be sacred. Mm. Um, and what we hold to be sacred are not just material things. They're based upon, um, richer, deeper, perhaps even more transcendent, um, transcendent things that that shine through the imminent realm and our interactions with it. So, if we're not going to be honest that that the making of things is also making sacred of things, mm-hmm. and therefore, a sensing that 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 reality is something of worth um, and of importance and mo- and more than just a resource, then I don't think we're going to get past the modern problem. Mm-hmm. So it may be theology in a completely unrecognizable form. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What are we making? Now? Yeah. <laughs> what do we make within our, our myth, our modern myth? Mm. I, don't, I don't see us making anything. Because I guess once... Interesting. Once, um, once the, the foundation of the myth is material... Then all you can make make is material things, right? You're not you're not crafting an internal world. You're not crafting a greater narrative, complete with I don't know you could say gods or whoever or whatever. Everything's material, so it's almost like consistently a disappointment because it's only yeah. it's only ever going to be just more of the same, which is never going to be different. But yeah, yeah I'll, 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 maybe I've answered my own question there. But what are we what are we making? Because you said you know well, what we choose to make is what we make sacred, and it's there doesn't feel to be much sacred in in, in this myth. No. No. And I, I mean, at the moment, I would say, if I were to generalize, I would say a lot of what we're making is endlessly repeating the same story, mm-hmm. which is glorifying the disembodied um, uh, um, techno-rational intellect over against everything else. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that's that's something that keeps haunting all our making. Um, despite, I mean, there's some many wonderful, many wonderful artists out there you know, trying to get out of that. Um, but uh, it's, it's an, it's an epoch. It's a momentous thing that's been going on for hundreds of years. So it will take a lot of joint effort. It will take a lot of communal, you know, being together, uh, not just thinking about different solutions, but learning to learning to be receptive, to feel and to create in, in radically different ways. Um, so that our making can can become, you know, uh, inflamed with as a, a kind of more healthy, wholesome vitality than it is now. Now it's just endlessly repeating 
what you know uh, Bacon and Descartes and Hobbes have said you know, 400 years ago. I, ju- I just don't, yeah, so we're still there in a sense. How do we get um, out of the repetition? Mm. <laughs> this is of the most important question because I've never found an answer for this. Like what shock is big enough? You know, I felt, I felt at the time that maybe the pandemic was going to be mm. big enough of a shock. But it wasn't. Everyone seems to have sort of almost made it to the edge of something new, something conscious. And then they sort of, oh, actually, that was quite comfortable. And we fell back into yeah. it quite swiftly. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. It's how do we, how? The, the question how is is a really interesting question because it's implicated in the kind of techno-rational framework, right? Mm, Which is like, yeah. what's the solution? So... Um, I know it's an easy thing to say, but, and this, you know, I learned again and again from Illich, right? That, that, the, that the acceptance of there is no how can paradoxically open us up to another form of intelligence, another mm-hmm. form of response. So I think to note in our being and in our thinking, to note how, how to note <laughs> Uh, how much we reach for the how, you know, how much we reach for, how do I fix this? What do I do about this? Um, I can see the problem with that, you know, uh, we do this all the time. Like this is, this is my solution. This is what I think we should all think or do or make. Um, that in itself, I think is part of that kind of uh, the modern story. Mm. How do I progress out of this? How do I overcome this? Um, so, which is that kind of heroic Titanic and for Shakespeare, tragic struggle, mm. you know, take over be the hero, be the, the, you know, the man who subdues all reality, the man <laughs> most of the time who subdues reality, um, to, to your will. And so perhaps in a sense, admitting a kind of, uh, a kind of non-how, um, so that you can become, I think, more attentive and receptive to what love is asking us to do rather than what we think. Should be, what's you love, know? what's love asking us to do? Well, you tell me, James, I'm working on that one. <laughs> um, you know, it, yeah, ex- I mean. Well, it's, it's, I, I think it's asking us to not make any, to try as hard as we might to not make any um, any maps of our own, you mm-hmm. know, or at least not hold on to them so tightly. It's strange, actually, just before we started um, recording and talking, uh, I had a couple of hours this morning where I was writing and I, I was uh, writing about the allegory of the the allegory of the long spoons in, in heaven and hell, you know, that I don't know mm. if you've come across this, no? the heaven, heaven purgatory and hell are all the same banquet table yeah. um, and they're all the same fire and the, it, it happens that the people who are sat at the banquet table in heaven are completely content and happy and the ones in hell are miserable uh the the change is that no one's elbows work <laughs> so you you can't feed yourself and you have right. to use long spoons right. to feed other people of course everyone in hell is prideful and annoyed because that's not the story to draw in the conversation we've been having it's not the story they wanted whereas the people yeah. in heaven well that's where we are you know that's and it's a great are. banquet we're enjoying it the food's good and then the people mm-hmm. in purgatory are sort of just about maybe starting to enjoy the company of others which is you know yeah, so that's really good. So in the light of what you said, I mean, <laughs> something comes to me. I mean, I think perhaps one of the things that love is calling us to do is a, a um, is firstly to acknowledge where we are, um, to acknowledge where we are um, without with resisting the urge to immediately change it. And also to learn to, you know, be open and attentive to the other, whether human or otherwise, mm-hmm. in a way that 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 decenters that that uh, willful voice that we've been brought up with and that we've been taught is the right way to be in the world. So, so that that acknowledgement, that listening, that that openness, developing receptivity, so we can learn to be together again. Mm. Um, so perhaps the first thing that that love is uh, is asking of us. I certainly get that a bit from Shakespeare. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's a very male attitude, though, isn't it? To ask what 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 what's love? How do I do it? Yeah, give me five. <laughs> right. Give me five tasks. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. Um, and not just just love as like you yeah. just, just go love. You know, yes. <laughs> it's like right. Well, between three and five p.m., I'll be I'll be 
loving today and then some other ridiculous you know it's back to that rationalist how like rationality and love and them really work yeah, together i'm afraid so but but rationality can be inspired by like it i think at, at its best it works like a tool um moved by a deeper intelligence and that deeper intelligence is has to be love mm-hmm. um but we've i mean i'm sure i'm repeating something many of your guests have said you know what i mean mm-hmm. we've we've removed we've rationality is front and center and the other stuff is just private emotive stuff so it isn't it isn't going to rule the show and i think that that's just it's become a habit to the extent that it's just ingrained in our culture mm-hmm. um you know, I see it. I mean, even teaching, you know, you, you, you're kind of like, well, you know, what are the outcomes? You know, um, give me some bullet points. What, what What's your course about? How are we going to measure um, outcomes? You know, how are we going to uh, satisfy uh, this or that demand? You know, it's, it's just it's just completely contained within that sort of managerial mindset. Mm-hmm. And education isn't about that at all. You know? no. um, so we, we're kind of we're kind of caught in that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is there anything you'd like to add about your book that you uh, feel we've, you know, overshadowed? I mean, there's much more in there, um, of course, which is um, for Shakespeare uh, readers. Um, you know, there's there's more specifics to do with Shakespeare and the two plays. Um, but is there anything else, um, you know, something you feel we've missed or overlooked? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure we've missed some stuff. No, there's not. Um, there's nothing else. I've really enjoyed the conversation and kind of weave in and out of the book. <laughs> I think the book was originally. I intended it as a Shakespeare book. Then through my, my studies and PhD and all that, it became a, a bit of a theology book. Then it kind of turned back into a Shakespeare book. So it, it uh, its strength is perhaps also its weakness that it will appeal to many different um, different uh, academic uh, uh, disciplines, if we can if we can call them that. I think that it, it probably will appeal more to the sort of pilgrim types who feel uh comfortable in all the disciplines but truly at home in none of them um mm. so it kind of crosses through philosophy and through theology and through poetry and literature and it just refuses to settle on any on any one of them so so in that way it kind of performs a sort of perambulation that is also ultimately an invocation of what i'm trying to say you know mm. um so yeah i would say that about the book yeah. uh, whereabouts can we find it <laughs> Well, uh, at the moment, it's on, you know, um, all good online bookstores. It's uh, forbiddingly expensive at the minute, but I think when the paperback comes out, which I think is this May, it will become a, a little bit more more affordable. Mm, mm. But And otherwise, come and find me at Dartington, you know. The, come and do the MA. It's really great. I'm having a ball teaching it. So, Are you, are you uh, working on any more books at the moment? Or? Next one's probably going to be on Blake. So um, yeah, so um, the two the two big voices in my life have been two Londoners and two Williams, right? So Shakespeare and Blake. Uh, and the next one's going to be on Blake, um, and um, I'm just sort of trying to stay open and receptive to what's coming with that. So it's in in its very early stages, but I'm excited. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I'll be sure to put the links for all these things in the description below. Um, but yeah, it's been a great conversation, uh, Valentin Jolie. Thanks very much. Thank you.